Okay, first two questions. Oh <laughs> um, we can start with you, sir, and you, madam, at the back. Uh, the UK, during the next few years, it faced two major uh, constitutional changes. Mm -hmm. Scotland was to become independent and we could leave the EU. What possible uh, consequences could you foresee out of those two yep. things? Okay. And the second question? Uh, thank you very much for your uh, talk. It's, uh Spoken very, very clearly, Good. and I have a better understanding about bits and about arbitration. But there's something that's not very clear to me, which is if countries um, are agreeing to these bits anyway, uh, what is the advantage of having TTIP? Yep. TTIP includes some countries and excludes others. For example, there are no African countries that are involved in either of the, the T TTIP or the TPP. Yep. And so, it is, uh, are these uh, uh, agreements, which are said to be US-led, uh, is the intention to use them as a battering ram to open up other countries? For example, you mentioned that Brazil didn't have any. So I just feel like I need that little bit of a jigsaw uh, building. Yeah, okay. Um, Scotland, yeah. If Scotland leaves the, the UK, technically, then those um, Agreements, the AT agreements that the UK has signed, wouldn't wouldn't apply to them any longer. And bear in mind, I'm not an international lawyer, but my understanding is it wouldn't. But it would be very simple for Holloway to just say um, to, for them to pass a blanket piece of boilerplate saying, "We will carry on our part of the obligation, which we was ours under those UK agreements." So it would be very easy for them to do that. And. The, all the companies and all the lawyers will tell them that if they don't, then the sky will fall on their heads. And my guess is that they will dutifully sign up to them immediately. Um, uh, leaving the EU, um, well, if we did, then the TTIP wouldn't wouldn't apply to us. But we've already signed um, uh, 80 agreements, so um, it, it wouldn't change things. And the key thing is this. And there are many key things, but this is another one of those annoying wrinkles. If a company wants to sue you, but you don't have a bilateral agreement with their home country, no problem. You just get fresh fields on the phone and you reincorporate your company in a country with whom ours does have an agreement. And this happened, I think it was Australia. A company, I think it was an American company, wanted to sue them. They couldn't, there's no agreement, but Australia did have a bilateral investment treaty with Mauritius, so the company involved just opened the branch in Mauritius, temporarily incorporated themselves there and sued for Mauritius. Problem solved. Um, uh, yes, the, why the TTIP? Um, it is a battering ram in the sense that um, even if other countries have signed some bilateral agreements, they probably haven't signed them with a lot of people. And, they may um, um, not enforce it in quite, they may not be quite so zealous in enforcing it. Um, the TTIP would supersede all of those things. So if, for instance, the, the TTIP includes um, allowing GM, then if you're a country that you nationally or locally say, well, we're not having it, this takes precedent. The laws of um, a trade agreement, and particularly the Bilateral Investment Treaty, supersede and trump all local, regional, and national laws. Any laws which are currently in place, which run foul of those agreements, will have to be changed and rewritten. And this is causing a big problem in the States, because the States are saying, hey, th th this is completely changing this concern which is central to the American political system of the relationship and power between the feds and the states. And this would just completely change it. And says, well, what do you mean local? We don't do it now about local. So it will be used as a batting ram in that way. Um, there are, as I said, between two and 3,000 meetings globally. So it's, it's, it's like government. They're tied down with a 1,000 or two or 3,000 little strings. And remember, each one can be enforced. Okay, next two questions. Uh, you, sir.
sir in the blue shirt and you sir yes so blue shirt could you just explain a little more about what a company's rights are when it chooses advocates you know revolutionary government wanted to put someone in their ad as well because you disagree with the system yep. would there be an accident mm -hmm. okay and second question it's quite a similar question actually Maybe a bit naive too, but what would happen if a company just, or if a company would turn around and say, we'll stop you, we're not going to pay our arbitration costs? Yeah, okay. Um, yes, you could put up anybody you like as an arbitrator, but don't forget that arbitrator is going to sit in a room with two other arbitrators who will work for Freshfield or King's Folk. If you're not really familiar with the law which those two will talk about, they're just going to ignore you. I mean, don't forget, there's no, there's no sort of super judge who's sitting to say, I mean, let's say you turned up as an arbitrator. You know, <coughs> that one, he's good, let's stick him in there. Give him hell. Me and my colleague here, two arbitrators from the major firms, we're just going to have a chat. And you can say what the hell you like. And we'll agree. And no one will know what we said or what you said. They won't know we didn't agree, we didn't listen to you. And uh, that'll be the end of that. So yeah, sure, you could send it, you could send them back to that if you want, you won't be really good. And countries usually pick those same small group because their logic is, this is a very specialised thing, we've got to have the most specialised person. So they end up choosing from the small group of people who this week are defending a nation and next week will be defending uh, the company. And the next week will be the, the third arbitrator. There's no... They're not like a judge where they're protected from a conflict of interest. They live with a conflict of interest. They work for the firms that make their money from servicing these global companies. You would think that might be a conflict of interest. So, um, that won't happen. Um, the question that you asked, um, why don't we just say, well, stuff you? The problem is it is enforceable. <laughs> And the way it's enforceable is exactly the same method that uh, the vulture funds use when they want to force a company. I don't know if you know what vulture funds are. No. Um, yeah. yeah? No. no. Okay, sorry. Um, the, the test case is Argentina. Argentina owed um, lots of money on its bonds, and then they default on those bonds. And they just say, look, you've had a financial crash, we can't pay you. The vulture funds go around, which would mean then you think would be a worthless bit of paper. Here's a bond from Argentina. And Argentina says, we're broke, we're not paying you. Things would be thrown away. Vulture funds, like Elliott Associates, buy them up for pennies in the pound. And then what they do is they take them to uh, court. And they take them to court in the southern district of Manhattan, which is Wall Street's court. And the reason they do it there is for this reason. This is how they enforce the, the arbitration. Is that all countries have assets in other countries. And which means they can be seen. Um, and more importantly, um, when you pay your bondholders, you pay the debt that your, your country has taken on, we sell, we've got a lot, we've got hundreds of billions of debt, <coughs> right? And you know as well as I do, this notion that if a country defaults on its debts, then the sky falls in. It's another discussion with it really will, but that's what all our political leaders believe, and that's what all the bankers tell them. So what they do is they go to the Southern District Court and they don't sue the nation. They don't sue Argentina or they wouldn't sue us if we just said, stuff you, we're not going to pay any attention to your ruling. They sue the bank that handles our debt payments. Because when a nation pays its bondholders, they do it via one of the very small number of <coughs> banks, JP Morgan, HSBC, Lloyds. And they go there and they say, this country is not treating us fairly. They're refusing to, to, to pay us. So you, Mr. Bank, we're suing you to stop you dealing with this rogue country. You must not handle any of their debt obligations because you, as a bank, must treat all your customers equally. The law is called pari passu. All right? So if this country is not going to pay us, then we're going to stop you allowing them to pay other people because that would be unfair. Which forces the country involved to default on its bonds. Completely default. That threat is usually against Argentina and it right. So they can enforce them. I'm afraid. I 
which it wasn't certain, but they can, and the test case has been for and also. Okay. Lots of questions. Um, you saw the white shirt and uh, you might want uh, the advertising for this session said that you would tell us how, what we could do about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, I've just got a question about the status of foreign companies and whether that's um, a foreign shareholder within a UK company could perhaps... I mean, I, I know very, very little about yeah. business. I yeah. Just yeah. Well, um, let me deal with that question first, if you don't mind, because yours is a big question. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> yes, um, it's possible for the shareholders in a company to all file separate arbitration, which is really, really handy because if you lose one arbitration, you just file another. And there have been cases where um, a, com a country has been taken to arbitration in two different, two different arbitration centres, lost in one, fought in another in one, and reap the benefits of that. And nobody seemed to clock that if, they, if these highly paid, brilliant international lawyers can, can contradict themselves in two, I mean, then what is the value of this legal judgment? Answer is, there's no, there's no legal sort of value to it. It's yes in one place and no in another. If you don't like the answer no, then go somewhere else and get yes. As to what we can do about it, let me preface this by saying, if I knew all the ways that we could do this, I think someone would probably shoot. Mm -hmm. um, however, there are things we can do, but this gets to the heart of the challenge that's before us. Um, we cannot defeat these things with um, tinkering around the edges. You can't say, well, we'd like to sign the um, trade agreement, but we'd like to maybe do away with the, the, the BIT in the middle of it, the, the, you know, the investor state dispute settlement. Now, that sounds a bit silly, but that's actually what the Labour Party in a briefing document for one of its MPs um, said. Because yeah. I, I was past this briefing document, it said, well, we've done all the benefits, the benefits that they keep promising, the ones that the World Bank study said weren't real, but the Labour Party still thinks <laughs> they might get them. <laughs> um, but we just don't like those numbers. <coughs> okay, is there a chance that they would be able to have the trade agreement and all the benefits, but not have to have this bit. Not a chance. How can I possibly say that? This is how. When they agreed NAFTA, which is the template for all of these things, they put the text out for discussion between the three signatories, US, the US had written most of it, Canada and Mexico. And if you look at the early drafts and you compare them with the one that was finally adopted, all of the chapters were changed quite considerably. You can trace the kind of brackets, can we script this out and add this? Bit, can we get rid of this bit and add you know, something else? And you can see how it evolved, except for Chapter 11, the Bilateral Investment Treaty. And not one word of that chapter was changed. Nothing was allowed. In other words, that's the key bit. Um, so there's no way that they will write that out. And when this suggestion was made a few months ago, there were very quickly articles in the more in the uh, the um, technical press saying absolutely not. We would make a mockery of it. So it's not going to happen through reformist politics. So I'm standing here to say that I believe the era of reformist politics is over. If you want to re to vote for a reformist party, good luck with that. They'll be able to do nothing. They'll make the promises, and when they get to Westminster, they'll do nothing. Right. Unfortunately, we don't have a radical. And I, when I say radical, I mean what the word means in its roots, to tear up by the roots. Mm -hmm. If you want to do something about this massive giving away of our sovereignty, you have to elect a party which says, we will take those 80 agreements and tear them up. We will respectfully send a letter to the 80 countries saying, we have great respect, we are terminating this agreement. Can you do that? Can you tear up international agreements? Of course you can. Remember, those of you who are old enough to salt to the, the great agreements to limit nuclear weapons? Well, what did they do after Carter? They just tore them up. Ronald Reagan just said, I said, I'm going to use that for the toilet. Right? You can do it, but not through tinkering at the edges. Right? You can, you could say, if you want arbitration, we're going to set up a new arbitration 
Now, I, I personally don't favor this scheme because it will be suborned as quick as it's made. But you could say, we'll set up something under the International um, Court in The Hague. I, I can guarantee that, that the business, that this, this suggestion has been made, by the way, and the business community has said, no, not on your life. Right? But there are ways of bringing this in. But basically, I think you are, faced, you are now faced, I believe, with the end of the era of reformist politics. Because that's the nature of what they're doing with these. That's the whole point of the talk is they're saying, take it away from democracy, take it away from any ability to reform this. Right? Which means if you continue to, to operate and to think about choosing which reformist party you want, they're, they're delighted with you because you're achieving that. We are now at the place where we have to say, we will find a radical party and we will vote for it. If you don't do that, you will get nothing. Now, let me give you another example, which is a small example. It doesn't pertain exactly to this, but it's an example I just happen to know about. That scattered through the law of the land are all kinds of obscure little places where international business is vulnerable. Okay? This example doesn't pertain particularly to this, but it's, a, it's an example of a very small bit of law which would have a massive effect right, at the heart of every single money laundering um, scandal, which are massive. You know, HSBC, Wachovia, Bank of America, the, um, BCCI. You will find a nest of British shell companies, English shell companies. Right? The reason is because the law of the land says that when you set up a company, you must declare who the company treasurer is and who the company director is. That director can be another company, and the director of that company can be another company in another jurisdiction. And what is not required is to declare who the beneficial owner is. Who ultimately benefits from the monies that flow through this company? That is not required. Now, to require would mean you go in with a 6 H pencil and put one of those little B signs between two sentences and go, and you must declare who the beneficial owner is for stock. Every Secretary of State for Business has had the opportunity to take his pencil or her pencil and do that. They've all chosen not to. You could elect someone and say to them, do this or die. And we're talking about a sentence. There are places like that in international law where this entire edifice is tremendously vulnerable. And they are still within democratic control if you act quickly. Um, you, sir, we have for a while, and then you, madam. Uh, question. I'll, I'll, I'll preface it with a very slight, short introduction. Very, very short. Um, I'm mem my name is Steve Wallace. I'm a member of the left unity. I've got myself as a revolutionary socialist, and I very much appreciate the last point um, about reformist politics for the answer. Um, I got involved in anti politics campaign. Anyway, yeah, I'm sort of to But anyway, um, what's. Um, Madam, if you want to. down the Europe street. That's basically what it does. Um, it generates a mountain of paper. But the power is with the Commission, and the Commission is our appointees from national governments. Right? So that's where the power currently lies, there and the ECB. Those are the two main places where the power lies. So if you have a if you, if you force Westminster to change its mind, then their representative to the, to the council will have to change his or her mind. Um, so the, the proper place to apply pressure is in Westminster, not your MEP. 
Rebbe, you can jump up and down and do what you like. And, and some of them do a good job, I'm sorry, I'm making fun of them, but the power is still at the moment in Westminster. Um, is anything happening in Westminster? Nothing. Because the main parties, by which I mean Labour and Conservative, um, I just regard the Lib Dems <laughs> as fluffers, basically. <laughs> okay, it was a little off color. But it's accurate. Um, <laughs> um, <laughs> you can rest you can go up and look that up. Um, <laughs> sorry. Um, um, there's intellectual capture. This is our problem. I mean, we had a change of government called the Tony Blair, but it wasn't a change of ideology. We've had that for the sons for 30 years. Um, you, you can have global free market um, capitalism with a gloating style. Or you can have global free market capitalism with a hand -wing. That's Tory, Tory and Labour. Think it. Um, I mean, they may say otherwise, but that's just hand -wing. They have, Their actions are, they're signed up to it. I mean, Tony Blair and Gordon Brown and deregulated city, they signed up to this. Our problem is intellectual capture. It's why it's not, none of this has been in the media, because they too have all bought into that mindset. Think about Stephanie Flanders, one of my bet noirs. She spent the entire financial crisis telling you this wasn't a problem, wasn't a problem, it was just a liquidity crisis. Which it never was, even the bankers knew that, but it wasn't a liquidity crisis, it was a solvency crisis. Why would she think this? Gosh. Surely she was an even-handed journalist. And then she leaves the BBC News and joins... JP. JP Morgan, thank you. <laughs> so, do you think she had any sort of prior notions? Maybe? So our, our main parties and our media have all bought into the one ideology. And frankly, if you accept the assumptions of that ideology, you will lose whatever argument you get into. Because the outcome is already in the assumptions. This is why I'm saying reformist politics, tinkering politics, is over. I mean, I know it's just a bloke from Scarborough telling you that. But regardless of the bloke from Scarborough, it's also the truth. You know this is the truth. They say, we're going to put a cap on energy prices. No, you won't. We're going to stop fracking. No, you won't. We'll put taxes on. No, you won't. There's three men, and they're all men, working up this country, in an arbitration room somewhere, and they'll say, no, you won't. And they have the power. Okay. Um, okay, very quickly, sir, one more chance. Lady at the back, and <laughs> you sit at the front. If you want to ask your question first. Yes, please. Yes, please. Um, I've seen an elephant in the room, but uh, it may be a hallucination. We are all buying products and services of these multinational corporations. So, what is it that we are not doing? I mean, apart from the obvious of um, not buying it, but is there anywhere we can tap into this enormous consumer power to empower us and defend ourselves? Yeah, okay. okay and, sir? Um, my concern is that you don't really have to convince many people here of what you're saying. But if we're going to talk about not getting into reformist politics and actually moving to a significant change, how are you going to convince the people out there? Because yep. I am Impressive. very concerned that if I start speaking to friends of mine about this, they'll say bollocks. <laughs> yep, okay. Um, what can we do? Um, there, are, there are forms of power which are within our reach. Um, let me give an example, which um, we were discussing earlier. <laughs> this is something that I talked to the trade unions about. I was at their summer school. Um, um, and by the way, I, I don't know Labour. I'd rather choke than know Labour. So, uh, um, uh, it's not that I come to it with a... I don't believe things because I have a prior ideological commitment to them. But I was talking to, to them and saying, look, how do, you, how do you rein in the banks? Well, the government's not going to do it. The, the regulatory um, uh, bodies aren't going to do it because they're all people seconded from the banks. And we know that nothing has changed. None of the laws that were talked about in 2009 have actually come to pass. Mm -hmm. 
uh, the Frank Dodd Act in America. <laughs> it couldn't rain in the gerbil. Um, what could you do? So what I said to them is, look, imagine that you took a leaf out of the trade unions books when they were created. At one point, there were no trade unions. You all just worked for whoever you worked for. If you didn't like it, well, what were you going to do? You were powerless, right? And then some rights park said, well, why don't we organize? We all work here. And through organizing, they said, well, it's not just me who's going to walk out the door if something is not right here. Me and all my mates are. And a form of power was born, which, for a good century, achieved things. We can argue about whether it's passed its sale by date or whether it was hijacked by people. That's all separate. But the fact of the matter is, a form of power which wasn't there suddenly was. Right? The one thing that the banks desperately need is your cash. Not because it's that cash they lend out. That's not true. If anybody still thinks that, they don't lend out money from deposits. They don't. You can ask me about it later, but that's just a fact of the matter. But they do need your cash in order to satisfy the regulators that the bank has enough liquidity. There's a ratio between how much they have on deposit and how much they can lend out to leverage. Imagine that you organized, unionized if you like, a depositors union. So you organized 30,000 people who were depositors in, let's say, HSBC. And I said to the unions, you probably have 30,000 depositors on your books already. And you ballot them electronically saying, do you like what HSBC is doing? I mean, just picking them out, you know, it could be an impact. And if you come back and, and basically send them and say no, you write a polite letter to HSBC saying, um, we're the depositors union, we control 30,000 of your depositors, and if you don't stop doing the following, then in this week, these people are going to move their money. It's, you know, it's a bit of a kerfuffle, but it's not impossible. The banks will have to be happy doing it. And there's a law that's going to be passed to make it easier. Could the banks survive 30,000 depositors? Even small ones taking the money out. No, they couldn't. Just put a bank on That is so dangerous that, that the government of the day would <coughs> be sitting there in number 11 going, shit, how do we rewrite the law of the land to stop this? Answer, they can't. So there are forms of power we could have, and there are refinements to that. I was talking to a friend of mine um, who's an accountant, and a clever like businessman. And he said, ah, there's ways of making that 10 times as powerful. Talk to him about it. <laughs> it can be done, but we need to step outside of the forms of power that we are used to, that we inherited, frankly, from our great grandparents. And we need to think, we need to be as creative as them. Which brings us to the, to the other question um, of the kind of the. Sorry, hang on. The revolutionary question. Do we need to convince everyone? Do we need to convince everyone? Thank you, yes. Everything. That question comes up all the time. That people say, how are you going to organize all these people? Um, and the answer is you couldn't, obviously. But has any, has any real revolutionary, and I don't mean, you know, Molotov cocktails kind of change. I just mean that change which says, no, that whole way that might be the case. <laughs> well, I'm a Quaker, no. <laughs> which means I am really not in favor of the um, guillotines and Molotov cocktails. I, I would consider that an utter collapse of the human imagination. We're a species that has the imagination um, to say, this would be universal suffrage, this would be an end to slavery, we can put someone on the moon and bring them back again. That we couldn't solve a problem which could be done via the ballot box in the 21st century is unimaginable. But I think you're right, sir. <coughs> if you don't fight the peace, you will fight the war. Everyone's brave and everyone can stand up and say, oh, I'm going to fight when war has been declared. That's easy, isn't it? When the Nazis are over there with their swastikas and marching up and down and being beastly to people, everyone can be a hero. But nobody fights for the peace. This is the time we have to fight. And you do have to do exactly the thing which you said is difficult. We are talking about the rollback of the democratic era. We're talking about your children and your grandchildren not being able to vote for things the way that your parents could. Are you willing to stand by and have that happen? If you are, at some point it will blow up and you, your children will fight the war. But you have the chance to fight the peace. What does that mean? It means that you have to say to yourself, 
I am willing to stand up in the public gathering, and I'm willing to stand up in the pub and say these kind of things, and feel foolish when they say, hey, we're not at war, are we? I mean, conspiracy theories. What's the worst that's going to happen to you? We're not even talking about them coming and burning your house down. We're talking about them going, <laughs> yeah. Right? Yeah. You have to be willing to take on that level of fight to be embarrassed at the pub in front of your mates. If you're not willing to do that, then you will get what you deserve. And let's go back to the English Revolution. The English Revolution is always written out of our history books. I bet you half of you never heard of the English Revolution. It's the English Civil War. It's in our history books, it's always made up as the first fashion war between men who wore frilly cuffs and others who had that. That's how we learned about it, isn't it? Capitalism around us. It was the first and the greatest of the Western revolutions. You can go back as a matter, of, it's all in the British Library. It's an amazing collection of the British Library. It's actually the core collection of the British Library. 20,000 pamphlets were collected by one of the booksellers. And what it shows, and it's, it was this collection which made me think, gosh, we should have a British Library, is that all, and I do mean all, of the ideas which we associate with the American and French revolutions, no taxation without representation, universal, <coughs> universal suffrage, not just suffrage for white people, universal suffrage, freedom of religion, freedom of the press, freedom of expression, freedom of, of uh, association. All of these ideas were written by Englishmen, and it was all Englishmen. And they were published within 400 yards of St. Paul's in 20 years of the American Revolution. And the people who had those ideas and wrote those pamphlets were no better than you and me. People like Gerald Wynne Stanley, mm -hmm. the founder of the biggest. He was a failed businessman from Baltimore. Mm -hmm. He was nobody. So, if they could do it, you can do it. You have to stop waiting. We have to stop waiting for some mythical town somewhere in Great Britain where they're breeding leaders. And they will know them when they arrive. Because as they step off to number 19, the bright white of leadership will shine forth and they'll say, my God, the leader has arrived, quick, follow us. There is no such place. The leaders will be people like Gerald Wynne Stanley, like you and you. They did it. And they're no better than you. Thank you for that. Thank you. Are you asking a question? Yes. Good. <laughs> now I'm going to speak. What's a positive message which can get them to people, to get them to wake up? Because they stop to eat it and they think you're talking about fair trade. You know, that's the end of I don't know what will get through to the average person. I don't know. You don't need to get through to the average person. You need to get through to a small number of people. Have you ever seen a landslide? Have you ever seen a landslide or an avalanche? Okay? I can guarantee you that when a landslide happens, not every clod of earth on that landslide had a meeting the night before saying, right, 8.15, all those in favour? Right, everyone's in favour, that's what we'll do. It doesn't happen that way. A handful of clods come loose, and everybody, every other clod on the other side just finds themselves in motion. You do not have to convince everyone. You do not have to find the message that convinces everyone. You have to find the, the message which convinces these people, the small number of people. And that message, the, the message which I have, is that you are fashioning the gift that you're going to give to the children. Will you be proud of that gift when you give it to them? The, 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 the gift you're fashioning is the life that they're going to lead. You will be pleased by a generation that 
put the national health in place, they put the welfare state in place, they probably fought World War II. What do you know? Did you do any of those things? I didn't. Okay.